Um, I'd like to talk a little bit on um, a kind of a framework for going forward and uh, I'm calling it Project Clean Slate and uh, it's for a number of reasons but the idea is to look at what could be independent of the uh, integration crunch backward compatibility. So Clean Slate is a metaphor, Eric, it's not a, an actual rock, okay? <laughs> Too bad. So I, I'm moved up to a level of abstraction here that's, uh, anyway, uh, next slide. Uh, this is a Monarchy Project Clean Slate on your, uh, the Google Docs. So I think one of the key issues here is the recognizing the overwhelming complexity of the current approach. And Peter Drucker long ago said the hospital is the most complex organization in modern society. Uh, perverse incentives, incentives, we all know. What's interesting about the VA, Kaiser, and DOD is that they are generally fairly positively incentivized. So the VA wants to have healthier vets, and if it can do more health with less money, it'll try to do that. And uh, despite all the bureaucratic problems that a big organization has, the VA is actually, I think, uh, remarkably progressive in that field. So working with the VA and using that as a, as a base for scaling up uh, uh, sounds really interesting to me, and Kaiser also. I see n squared problems every time I turn around. Uh, people say, well, we'll demonstrate this with n equals 2. So we have all these n equals 2 prototypes and how easy it is to integrate, well, how hard, you know, one hospital in one setting. And uh, then they say, well, we'll just scale it up to 300. So there's a big difference between n equals 2 and n equals 300. I've lived that n equals 300 for years, and I can tell you it's different. Uh, the, the bigger is different. And I think that's also uh, a key for look going forward, is that if we can look at this large high-N network uh, model with uh, sufficient scale, uh, we can have some breakthrough thinking here. So that's one of the issues that I want to talk about. Um, I think the standardization data warehouse model is hopelessly rigid and unmanageable. Uh, again, John's comment about blood pressure is still not, not standardized after 35 years. Um, what, what is that going to do with the other 10,000 things we need to do? So are we going to get standardized in the year 2400? Um, and I think it's getting worse. The ICD-10 is, uh, you know, what, tenfold increase. And building a standard around being crushed by non-venomous reptiles um, I don't think really helps their understanding of medicine. Uh, focusing on fixing the problem, you know, it's, it's this, this, like your garage shop mechanic and somebody drops all these parts on your driveway and says, here, integrate this and make it a full system. Um, so it, it's always this, let's add another fix, let's put another Band-Aid on it, let's have a standard for the standard. Uh, but no one is really looking at a clean slate, fresh look of what could be at a high scale high semantic value uh, uh, system. And again, looking at the, what if for stakeholders are least likely to look at an innovative future, if we went to the Department of Education to sponsor the next online encyclopedia and they funded Encyclopedia Britannica to make it happen, uh, where would we be? Uh, you can't go to the stakeholders in a perversely incentivized system and say come up with a cleanly incentivized system. So it has to be outside the system, it has to be kind of a radical uh, underground or, or something that's disruptively innovative. And I don't see that innovation coming from either Washington or uh, the, the, uh, uh, the standards bodies. I mean people talk about it a lot and you know we have innovation committees and we have this and that but the, the true innovation I don't see happening. And uh, so that's, that's an issue here. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is where I was going to put in my integration crunch showing that an intercom scales one way, the uh, PBX uh, starts more expensive, it goes flat, and the, the crossover between the integration crunch where everybody's spending all their money trying to integrate to the past versus scaling up to the new future is really the critical point here. So that's the uh, associative avalanche I'm calling it now, or I did call it, I had another name I was going to play with on that, but I, I think that's really the key thing that I'd like to look at is what's the simple, you know, pinprick in the avalanche that we can 
can do. So I'm, I'm looking for simplicity, not, not expanding complexity. But uh, in the same way as network solutions trigger that avalanche through the domain names, can we trigger an avalanche towards this, this future system through that? So, next slide. What are the simple initial conditions for a new future system? Uh, I think identity is really the key thing. Uh, connectivity. Um, you design from a state of connectivity. You know, you just assume that you have a, a connection, and and you work with that. You, it's connectivity isn't a, a rare bolt-on uh, exchange model. It's just everything is connected by virtue of participating in this space. Then uh, the move to an information space concept architecture instead of an integrated enterprise concept, I think, is also critical. So we're talking about an, a space that's defined by connectivity. And then the relationship comes in. How are these things related? And uh, uh, so in, in web land, that's identity is URL, connectivity was HTTP, relationship was HTML. And the constraints that was really interesting, uh, if you look at what Tim Berners-Lee did, by making it constrained to TCP IP, he broke away from the constraint he broke away from the constraint that uh, you'd have to interface AOL to the prodigy and everything. So creating this outside constraint and moving the space outside of the proprietary world at the time was what made the web work. And so he started with these simple initial conditions and he started it allowed it to grow. The fitness function, which is the definition of what is a good website, was um, for the web was consumer attention. People pay attention to your site, it's it's a good website. That's what made it grow. Uh, so there was a thousand attempts to do Google and finally there was one that worked right. And so that's the evolutionary shaping of things. So the idea is you start simple and then what is a fitness function? What actually makes us select this item versus another approach? And that question is what what is the purpose of a healthcare system? And that begs a very very deep and critical question, but that's what we have to answer. What are we really trying to accomplish here? Okay, next question. So uh, the model of an inf inf information space instead of integrated system, I'm proposing uh, for a, a, a model to call it the universal health space, large scale fine grained network of interaction. Uh, so it's large scale, uh, so we can start looking at the network effects right off the bat. Uh, in fine grained, the PCAS report calls it the minimum actionable unit of activity or something like that. But the, the fine granularity is critical. This does allow for hierarchies to be superimposed on the data. So if you do have a hierarchical taxonomy, if you want to put a Dewey Decimal System on it, you can still do it, but you don't lose the granularity and the referenceability. And if what you would use today isn't right and you want to do it differently in tomorrow, you put a different hierarchy on it. You don't lose that data. You don't lose that context. It doesn't go away. It's just a different way of looking at it. And I think this is what Peter Norberg was saying, is ingest the data once and then build a triple store on top of it and look at it as you like. A universal health language is how do you make sense using a language, not APIs. If you look at most of the standards today, it it's defines APIs. You know, it's, it's all uh, a, an application programmer interface model. It's not a linguistic model, framework. And it's a little bit like using IP addresses instead of domain names. In, in one sense, they're equivalent, but it has to do with how you bind to it. So using a language to talk about this rather than specific interfaces, I think is a huge step forward and quite valuable. And if you look at the web, it's defined as language and linguistic references. The URL is a language. The HTTP is a protocol language. Um, so I think that's really uh, critical. If you look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia was a linguistic binding to the language. You, you're not putting in file names. You're using uh, uh, wiki words. And then URIs, to me, uh, to give everything a name is really a key step forward. So. Um, so that's basically you know, the, the framework that I'm looking towards. And uh, I'd like to see if we could integrate it with David's partition logic and kind of the grassroots uh, uh, substance migrating upward into form rather than the, the pigeonhole paradigm of the 
form defining the, the pigeonholes for the substance as you pull it in. So anyway, the move to an information space, uh, the connectivity, and just being able to a name for everything, and this gets into all the dicey issues of patient identifier, but it also gives us a way of, of building names for all of our nomenclatures and everything. So I think it's a way to get to the minimum number of moving parts to where we want to go. So next, am I at the end of my slide? Okay, the new needs, uh, we need to support everything is, mis everything is miscellaneous model. That's the Google model. Uh, that doesn't preclude standardized taxonomies and everything. But the baseline, the foundation, is that it, it is capable of dealing with the context of everything is miscellaneous. To express the full context of medical information, if you start looking at social networks, if you look at genomics and, and family relationships, uh, epidemics and where they've traveled to, there's all this linked data that has to be incorporated into our understanding. I think John Madison mentioned that yesterday. But to just say we're going to crunch all this data, turn it into a, uh, a scalar value in absence of the rest of its context, and now from now on use that data without having the, the original context as uh, referenceable, I think is, is not going to get us there. So, and that concerns me about the VISTA model right now. We have a very rich semantics in the data dictionary that is being lost when we turn it into a, a, a taxonomically defined uh, exchange. So the an interface, long time VISTA uh, maxim is an interface is a barrier to everything it's not defined for. So it, it blocks off all this stuff and it says, okay, we're gonna get blood pressure this way. But there's still a lot more context and semantics in the database that is valuable for future machine learning and data mining that I hope we're not throwing away. As we talked about yesterday, a new model for categorization, accepting the excluded middle. Uh, you can be A and B, A and not A, right? Um, and uh, the, they have to have a way of doing that. So I think that's one of the critical holes in the fabric of medical tech terminology, fabric of reality of medicine is we don't allow uh, this blurring of uh, A and not A type logic. And then the linking of linked data concepts for life sciences, epidemiology, genomics, and social networks, being able to link all these things together in an associative model. We're never going to build a federated database of all life science information, all genomics and epidemiology. The, the federation model of building a copy and exporting it according to standards formats is not going to be able to adapt to the, uh, the future. So it has to be this open, loosely coupled associative linked data model. And I think I, what I'm talking about, I think it can be instantiated by pretty mature technologies out there today. Uh, I, mean, I, in a, I mean, I don't know them as well as, as Eric does, but I think the pieces to make this happen are pretty, pretty well developed. Okay, next. So I have this thing called cascades. And uh, we want, like to talk about cause in medicine, that X caused Y. And, you know, did this violent movie cause this, this murder shooting or whatever? Well, yes and no. It was a 42% or 19% cause. And lawyers like to establish causality that way. But the idea of, of the scalar value being massaged into a, uh, a normal distribution with this deviation for this particular value and putting it into random control tiles and getting all the permutations that we're getting of drugs, of genomics and things like that. So the whole random cl uh, clinical trials model that's based on this scalar causality stuff is, is going to collapse under the complexity of what we're trying to, to understand. So I'm calling that a cascade of effects that, that when you have a network that's poised to do something, be it an immune system, a, a histamine system, or or psychological state or whatever, uh, that's different and it reacts to stimulus different than if it's just the, the median, if you will. So um, James Fowler is looking at that with uh, his social network, uh, network analysis of healthcare and the book Connected. And he's on my list for a future uh, workshop. Um, 
and so this has to do with things happening at large scale. And you could tar start talking about power law distributions of if you, if you sample the number of connected sites to your web, um, if, you, if you, a number of sites that connect to a given website, if you sample uh, a, a thousand websites on the web, you might say, well, it's, it's three. If Google happens to be in your sample of a thousand, it's a gazillion. So you can't, you can't use the, the small n understanding of this. And so how do you do this at very large scale? And I think Peter Norvig brought out a really interesting point yesterday is Google likes to look at the most frequent analysis, a frequent occurrence of things. So uh, it, it likes to see the common things and, and work off of that. Medicine, we're looking at some of the rare things. And how you manage rarity um, is, is another thing. Polyscalar is things happening at multiple scales. I forgot in the chart there was a triangle diagram, a pyramid somebody did yesterday. But oh, yeah, the life's compact complexity pyramid. Yeah. So things can happen at the genomic level, the organ, the systems, the ecosystem, the, the species level. And HIV AIDS works at lots of different scales. You know, it's a genetic DNA, global transportation, truckers in Africa thing. But it doesn't say, okay, what I'm going to focus on the uh, genetic uh, distribution of this disease. You know, it's, it does everything at once. So one of the things about uh, cascades that I'm particularly interested in understanding is what happens when you have a little effect at many different scales simultaneously. Can this tweaking these intrinsics, the scale-free properties of the system, a little bit have a huge effect, this cascading effect? And is it a way of looking if a system is poised? So if a system is, is on the verge of losing its identity in the immune system, for example, for some reason, and, and it doesn't know what antigens to attack anymore, if it's poised and it happens to see a bad antigen, pathogen, uh, is, will it cascade into a, a bad thing? But anyway, the ca cascades are, are a very interesting topic to me. I haven't seen the math for it. The closest thing I've come to is uh, Kolmogorov nuclear explosion cascades. He was a Russian mathematician looking at how bombs explode. So you hit the bomb with a certain frequency and it explodes at all frequencies. So he's, he talks about that cascading in the context of nuclear explosions. Uh, hopefully we think of it differently in healthcare. A little bit, yeah. Um, I haven't seen that in multi-scale stuff, so. Um. so Tom, can you, can you help me understand the second bullet? Can you insert a noun after me right. so I can parse that? There? Polyscalar? Right. OK. Little things at multiple scale having many. OK. Uh, oh, oh I, that, yeah, uh, having many uh, nothings. Uh, <laughs> Fill in the blank. Uh, that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in the blank. Okay, having many uh, effects or or major effect. I, I obviously didn't yeah, type yeah. it right. Yeah. Having yeah, great yeah. aggregate effect. Aggregate effect. Okay. 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 So. Okay. The, yeah. Okay. All right. That's fine. So the framework is you have this stack of of scales: the the genomic scale, the cellular organ, the the cellular scale, the organ, the immune system, the body, mind, the family, species. Okay. Typically, we have a science per scale. OK, each science looks for causality. If you poke this thing this way, this will happen. So that's causality. But it, you, what you end up doing is you limit the spectrum that you look at uh, in order to prove, have a provable causal relationship. So physicists do physics. Population biologists do population biology. But never the two shall meet. So and you have this continuum of scales from the very small to the very large. So I'm saying, let's. Let's look at the intrinsics or the scale-free properties of the system up and down there and say, what, what if you change each, each item into different scale a little bit? So you change the, the cellular identity a little bit. You change the genomic identity a little bit. You change the psychological identity a little bit. Could that have a greater cascading effect? So the one thing, for example, people losing their jobs and or, or, or loss of identity in that sense frequently have an onset of cancer or autoimmune response in 18 months. I've kind of anecdotal stuff. But it's, it, could that be losing identity at the psychosocial level affects your immune system or your cancer resistance? And we don't have a science way of doing that. And you can't do that with random control trials looking for causality. 
So we don't have a way of understanding the, the pinprick and the avalanche. Uh, maybe we do, I, I haven't seen it, but the system has to be able to at least express things at this scale. And maybe genomics data is an entirely different anchor point than cellular data or, or person data. So right, we. Yeah, um, I, my apologies for not completing it. Um, but again, the, the 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 scale of genomic data as it relates to ancestry data and family information, they're two different scales. But right now, the EHR basically is focusing on the scale of billable transactions, you know, what the provider does to the consumer, and can we categorize that so we can bill it better. Next. Uh, so, skunk works. Uh, you know, the, I don't think we need to extol the virtues of uh, small groups, but could we formulate a skunk works approach to this and just get a small team of unencumbered thinkers that, that can handle this get it funded to do a prototype and find sufficient scale to look at the, the high-end thinking that we could do. And, uh, you know, Chuck Hagel was the funder of the VA Skunk Works that became Vista. He was the uh, deputy director of the VA at the time. So I had a group called the Underground Railroad and I gave him a certificate when he was in the VA in uh, 1982 for uh, unlimited free passage on the Underground Railroad. And when he ha went through his Senate confirmation hearings, he, he mentioned something about having a role in the, the VA, and he, he kind of suppressed a chuckle. Uh, yeah. But um, anyway, so he's, he's, he's one of us, and he, and he gave the green light to the, the Vista Skunk Works 30 years ago. So I'm hoping I can pull on that certificate and get him to approve another Skunk Works. Um, you know, between Korea, Iraq, Is he still and at the VA? No, no, he's the Secretary, Secretary of Defense. Oh, Chuck Hagel. So anyway, um, he's risen to his level of incompetence. Is that what? It is? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> so again, the Vista oh, that was <laughs> incredibly it was. simple initial design of 19 commands, 22 functions, one data type, and 22 functions, and that was what allowed it to flow and, and port over, you know, five, six generations of hardware, things like that. It's kind of lost the simplicity over the years, shall we say. People start pinpricking it. Yeah, well, it, sledgehammering. Sledgehammer. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no, it got centralized and, and, you know, small team projects of three or four programmers turned into $100 million procurements that for some reason didn't quite work right. And so we had to do $150 million procurement. Um, so anyway, uh, this sense of being unencumbered but still dedicated to the process. I mean, you, you, these, there's a lot of people that have a lot of skills that want to do it. Um, Large-scale systems integrators may not be the ones that are free to uh, pursue this. So, um, so that, that my bottom line is I'd like to pitch a Skunk Works and get a small group of people. Oh, it's already started, you know, I mean, and... Uh, see what we can do with a, uh, a real live demonstration of these ideas in our own little sandbox uh, and see what we can make happen. So is that my last page? It must be. Okay, so that's uh, my Skunk Works proposal.